It takes me about an hour and a half to get to work because the traffic is just like, you know, bumper to bumper. And uh, yeah, you either take a nap or you read or, you know, if you got some work. But a good time for me to write, yeah. Do you write your book in the back of a car? Yep, most of it. I lost my virginity in the back of a car. That sounds kind of way only, more fun, yeah. That's the only my own I wish, to Maybe we should be doing thing. that, yeah. Oh, <laughs> let's I, I don't let's know. put away the laptops. <laughs> Uh, you're very forward. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, uh, you know, you know. So, I, I only, I'm on the clock, man. I got, like, <laughs> I got other places to go. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the traffic in Dhaka. Like, what's it like? Well, you know, it, you you get the cars, right? But then you also have the rickshaws. So those are like the kind of bicycles with a seat in the back. And then you've got these. Uh, planks of bamboo with wheels like uh, it's like a seesaw and you and and it's used for carrying stuff so it's like a mini truck but it's powered by humans so they're just pushing it yeah so they're, they're, one guy's pulling it in the front and one guy's pushing it from the back uh, and they just carry like loads of stuff on this so you got all this like weird traffic that all moves at different speeds and a lot of them don't have brakes so if you've got a car they're going to be using your car as you know, so what people do is they put iron bars all around the car to protect the the actual fender, and w which which you know <laughs> it's, it sounds a bit aggressive, but it's necessary. the The only problem is that sometimes the the iron bars the edges poke out, and pedestrians get caught, like their clothes. Yeah. And then they get like dragged along the street, and this is this has happened actually like many times, <laughs> and, and and then the government actually told us like. If you put iron bars around your car, you should file down the edges and make sure that pedestrians don't get caught and, and you know, dragged to their death. Uh, tuk tucks I like. Tuck, yeah, those, those are good too. Yeah, yeah. We, we have those. We have those as well. They're, they're, they're kind of dangerous. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've got a lot of rioting going on right now in our country, uh, political violence, whatever. So these are the, the tuk-tuks, you know, the, we, we call them baby taxis, right, because they're like small taxis. Mm -hmm what the people do the rioters they they quickly run run up to one they tip it over and then they set it on fire <laughs> and so if you're a passenger like sometimes they don't let you out they just you set know? you on fire yeah well the, well one one side of the door is normally like tied up with yarn right. and the other side is open and that's to stop like muggers from getting in from right. both sides but if you get tipped over on the wrong side then the the side that's open is is blocked yeah you're fucked uh, yeah then you're then you're really fucked like Wow. We only do that when this uh, team wins a sporting event, like a championship. Then we tip over cars and light them on fire. But otherwise, in, yeah, nice. in this country, we, we don't... You, you also tip over cows. So live in Dhaka, you never been to Baghdad. You want to, yeah. you know, how did you imagine what was happening there? I read a lot of blogs, like the, you know, like every single soldier has got a blog and they're like writing about their experiences there or whatever. And uh, a lot of it's just made up, you know. I saw all the footage, all the film, all those embedded yeah. journalists and stuff, and it just seemed like totally real. I was like, was this guy there? Was Saad uh, embedded with the, you know, 1st <laughs> no. Cavalry Airborne? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was a ca I was a camel jockey. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you you live in Dhaka, which is one of the world's mega cities. Los Angeles is one of the world's mega cities. Uh, how, how many people do you have? Uh, in the whole metropolitan area, seventeen point yeah. eight million. Seventeen point eight. I think we're we're about a sixteen, maybe something yeah, like that. In your face, man. Like, like some of these places are like far off in the mountains, man. They're like they're <laughs> mountain communities. <laughs> they're gonna be real city people. They gotta live yeah, in like the, you know. Well, that's happening. Is the I mean, yeah, we have some hillbillies, you know, and okay, so there, you but... should discount that from your <laughs> census, right? Okay, so seventeen million. Uh, fair All enough. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, how, how, how many cars do you have? Now you probably got more cars than us. Uh, yeah, but we. How, don't... How, how much livestock do you have? Inside the city oh, boundary. Oh, actually, that's a really good question. And we, I don't think we have any bamboo planks on wheels. All right, so, so, we, so we, we're ahead yeah, of that I think maybe you guys are the future. Yeah. You know. What did that mean for you as a writer, like, to live in this kind of environment? You know, city people are, are like, much cooler than country people, basically. Right? Because you're living in the city, you know, you get all this conflict and all this tension. And 
all the problems that people living on top of each other have. So I think that, you know, the writing about urban spaces is, is anyway for me a lot more interesting than, you know, right. than describing the countryside or whatever. That just doesn't... No, for me too, because you've got all these different lives and yeah. people that overlap and intersect. And yeah, exactly. Into each other. Uh, the uh, the culture in Bangla, it, it's like really, really strong and really high. So there's like thousands of books that come out every year. We have a we have a huge book fair for a whole month, but that's only in Bangla. And uh, so if you're not part of that and you're writing in some other language, then it's like impossible. Right. So. So you write in English mostly. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I only write in English. Okay. So. For me, like, I got an audience of, like, 20 people. And, uh, well, that may change now that you're here. There, you may get another 20. I, here, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I could, I could get the other 20. New Yorkers are so proud of like, New York. And I got, like, thousands of books that are, like, celebrating New York, you know, kind of. Which uh, yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't really happen for LA, I guess. No. Well, we were like Raymond Chandler and stuff, but we were really like, what's a great LA novel? It could be anything. There's so many different versions of what a great LA novel is. Um, so, you know, Escape from Baghdad could be a great LA novel, even yeah. though it's set in Baghdad. But one of my favorite characters in your book is, uh, is Hoffman, the American yeah. soldier who's. How did you. Uh, How'd you come up with that guy? Uh, you know what? He, uh, he he's he's my favorite too. Yeah, <laughs> I I, uh, I had a lot of fun with him. But you know, he he's kind of straddling that balance between like idiocy and and genius, right? And mm -hmm. and you're never quite sure. But but he wins in the end. And and uh, he's he's also an innocent, right? Right. Like, like really, he's he's the one guy who's who's like the most innocent of of everybody. Right, but he's also crazy. He's a very good representation of American foreign policy because he arrives at a situation and immediately pays people off with cash or gives them bottles of booze and does <laughs> yeah. stuff like. He doesn't really solve any problems. He just like makes the problems go away temporarily. Well, you know, I, I think that there are really really smart Americans, and then there are like the, you know, <laughs> everybody else. The the, the 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 more ignorant, you know, like. And uh, it's interesting because I think you have maybe also the dumbest people in the world and also the smartest people in the world. So you've, you've got the range. And uh, it, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the, the soldiers that you send, send over there, right. some of them are, are really smart, obviously. Right. And, uh, and they know everything. And then they would also know that, that the motivations for the war are not necessarily, you know, what, what's out in Fox News or whatever, right? right. So, so when, you know, I, I was kind of interested in that. Like, what, what happens when, when the soldiers themselves don't believe the, you know, the, the bigger propaganda sort of right. thing? And then they kind of understand that there are all these hidden strands and they, they know how to kind of dive in there and, and kind of work that system. There's a lot of liberation and just not giving a fuck anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, and I always imagine that. Like, the, you're really free the moment you've lost everything. Right. You know, because when you still have hope, you, you feel despair, you feel uh, the burden of that hope, you know, of, of trying to recover, of trying to get on with your life. But when you've actually absolutely lost it, uh, and then you've lost it, you know, then, you, then you're free, then you can be whatever you want. Right. There isn't really anything left to look forward to, there's nothing left to, uh, which I imagine is quite liberating. Thanks for coming all the way from Dhaka through, what is it, Guangzhou, China? Yeah, yeah, man. To finally to Los Angeles to, to have some uh, Korean food with you. Yo, but I feel like I'm still in China. Yeah. <laughs> it's good food. <laughs>